Okay, well, thanks for having me. Thanks, Abby and Ben. Um, appreciate being here to talk a little bit about portfolios. Uh, my name is Jeff Knight. I'm a graphic designer, uh, newly employed uh, faculty member in the art department, teaching graphic design and printmaking. Uh, my background uh, goes way back into uh, graphic design, uh, back to uh, receiving my master's degree in graphic design from the Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia. Um, and then kind of working various jobs throughout uh, graphic design. So in-house, freelance, uh, agency, you name it, I've pretty much done it. Um, and now uh, faculty member, so now teaching that. So um, privileged to be here and glad to talk to you guys a little bit about portfolios and kind of what to expect. Um, I don't necessarily have a, a very specific sort of uh you know bullet list i guess of what to talk about so we'll definitely go over some questions and stuff that you might have later on um, i'll just kind of touch on a few different uh things uh but a little bit about kind of my background um is serial uh is a or, or a company that i started for uh, my own design business um, it's still operating i still kind of dabble in that every once in a while keep it alive um and it's uh i do a lot of work for for local clients and regional clients um, uh, like they said, I've done the work for uh, Carson Wentz and um, I work for Half Brothers Brewing Company in Grand Forks. I do all their can designs and I did their logo and I do a lot of, uh, it, it's very random work to be honest. So a lot of random work and random clients that I have and um, a lot of people just reach out and um, I just help them out with whatever they need. So logos or layout designs, websites, um, marketing materials, anything uh, like that. I, I help out various businesses with. And so uh, I really enjoy doing that work. Um, I find it really helpful. I'm also at home. And so if you hear a dog whining in the background, just ignore that. Um, or if you hear a kid yelling, that's that's happening. Um, but um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess, um, I have taught some portfolio classes in the past with students and getting them prepared for what to kind of expect going into a sort of working world situation. Hang on one second. It was $35. I thought it was four. Sorry, that was my son telling me how much he spent at Target. <laughs> um, all right, so if I'm not interrupted again, is like anything in the house here? Um, so yeah, getting getting students ready for just kind of what is next. So leaving college and kind of going into the working world, what to expect and what to do, um, what to get ready for. And uh, a lot of that is just kind of a, uh, especially for graphic design students, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into our portfolios as I'm sure you guys do. Um, and mostly because we are specifically judged uh, on the layout of that portfolio. You know, we are judged on sort of what that portfolio looks like because that's what we do, right? If our portfolio is laid out sloppily or uh, if it's not organized correctly and doesn't really make any sense to the viewer, then there's a problem there and there's something that um, needs to be corrected and ultimately doesn't look very good on us as designers because that was something that uh, was a project that was completely our responsibility to uh, construct and put together. Um, so yeah, portfolios can be kind of, uh, they can be difficult. They can be, um, you know, interesting in terms of how you want to structure that information. Um, I know a lot of designers have different thoughts on this. So, you know, what I say here, you might hear from another designer saying sometimes the complete opposite. And it really just depends on what each individual uh, business or person is looking for. Sometimes if it's a very specific niche uh, job or, or person that you're, you're talking to, they might have a very specific type of um, thing that they're looking for. And that might be very different than what I'm looking for. Um, so it really depends. And it's always good to know a little bit more of who you're speaking to. So the fact that you guys kind of know that already is really helpful, I think, in that you know kind of who you're talking to, you know kind of what they want to, what they want to see. Um, but there's times too where you just don't. And so I think there are some general kind of um, housekeeping type stuff with portfolios that are just kind of good to remember, remember and go over. You kind of mentioned a few of them and I'm gonna to touch on them a little bit here, but um, things that are sort of just universal in the sense that you want to uh, share. So um, the first thing I'll just kind of say is uh, portfolios are meant to be your best work. And, and that's to be a representation of the work 
you know, that you've done, but also a representation of the best work that you've done. And I would tell a lot of design students this where um, they might have had a variety of classes and a variety of projects throughout the years, and they want to include everything in their portfolio. And the first thing I'm going to tell them is to not include everything in their portfolio, because not everything is necessarily worth putting in their portfolio. It's not, um, you know, it might have been a really great project or it might have seemed really important at the time. Maybe you spent a ton of time on it. Um, if you, in the end, if that project is not one of your best projects, it's not worth to put in the, your portfolio. It just doesn't make sense because um, what's going to end up happening is you're going to be in front of someone explaining that project. And if there isn't anything meaningful between you and that project, it's going to come across and it's either going to look like, um, you know, there really wasn't much interest there and you were just kind of doing a project or it's just kind of a, a meh sort of project. And your portfolio should not be full of meh projects. They should be filled with really great projects that um, are meant to, you know, wow the other person or the, the client or the interviewer or whoever it is you're talking to. Um, so I always say like, I would much rather see a portfolio of five absolutely dynamite pieces than a portfolio of 20 meh pieces, right? Because I just wanna see the best work that they're capable of doing. I can look through a lot of, uh, you know, sort of subpar and, and standardized work that, you know, like some, pretty basic ad stuff and whatever. Anybody can kind of do that, but I really want to see the best work that, that students especially are the most passionate about. And that's kind of the next part is, is the passion projects. I really want to see work that you're excited about because believe it or not, it actually comes through in your voice and in how you speak about it. If I'm sitting across from a student and I've sat through a lot of portfolio reviews and interviews, um, you can definitely tell which project students are excited about and which ones they sort of were forced to labor over and the ones that they really hated because their tone just changes. And it's sort of, yeah, I did this project and yeah, I completed these sort of tasks, but, you know, sort of in the end, you realize, yeah, they didn't really like it. They didn't enjoy it. They didn't, um, there wasn't really anything passionate there that they were involved in. Um, so it, the couple things there is to either put in only those projects that really are, you know, you're passionate about, you're excited about, or find something in those projects that you're passionate about and excited about, uh, because that will come across and that'll come across from your personality and just kind of how you present things. Um, if there isn't anything that you can find, really try to just dig in deep and find something in that project that you get really excited about. And maybe it's just one little aspect of that project, but at least then uh, your tone changes, you start to smile, people like that, they, they see that you're getting excited and that you're, you have this energy about you, as opposed to, well, yeah, that was a school assignment and, you know, it was cool, but uh, whatever, you know, that, that's not exciting, I don't want to hear that, nobody wants to hear that, right, that's just, that's not going to go anywhere. Um, I want to hear where, where your passion lies. And then the last part is kind of your voice and hearing your voice through things is, um, you know, is there a way in the collection of work that you have in your portfolio to somehow define more of your voice as a designer, as an architect, what do you want to say and how can you say it throughout this layout and throughout this book that you're presenting or uh, however it is you want to present it. And that can come across in a few ways, you know, thinking about are you specializing in a specific area of architecture? Is there a specific sort of, um, you know, passion that you have that you want to repeat over and over again? Um, just kind of thinking about that. Uh, as you go through it and as you're starting to lay out pages and, and sections of things. Um, I kind of encourage students to start strong, end strong, and try to find something strong in the middle. So it's kind of, you know, put your best work right away, put your best work at the very end, uh, because you want to leave them with something really impressive too. So the very last piece is probably the one that they're going to remember the most. Um, so keep that one, you know, one that you really are passionate and excited about make the first one really passionate and excited, and then find some, some way to kind of fill up that middle to just kind of keep the, the tone of things going. You don't want to, you know, start out really uh, low on the spectrum of excitement and then build, build, build to stuff. You want to keep kind of a, a nice sort of uh, equal tone throughout so that you're, you're also just kind of keeping yourself in check that you can, you know, turn the page and go from a really excited project to something that, you know, maybe is just a slightly less excited about. And then you're going back to excitement and, and back and forth like that. So um, that would be my suggestion. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other things here. Uh, 
the work that you actually display, um, I think it was mentioned, you know, not hearing a paragraph worth of information. Same thing with designers. We don't, uh, if we're not impressed with sort of what is shown to us immediately, um, it's not going to come across in a paragraph of text either. Uh, so keep it short, keep it simple, uh, keep it, you know, straightforward. I would somehow even recommend uh, having a couple different versions. And I don't know if this applies to the presentations you guys are doing, but um, having a couple different ways of presenting. If you had 20 minutes to present a portfolio of work to someone, what would that look like? And then what would it look like if you had an interview where you had maybe a little bit longer? And maybe you can skew those numbers a little bit in terms of time. So maybe it's five minutes and maybe it's 30 minutes or something. Um, you know, if you had five minutes, you wouldn't spend a lot of time on one project saying every single piece that went into it, you would really kind of hit the high points and then move on right away to the next one. So it's kind of creating that shortened version, that sort of almost elevator pitch version where um, if you have only a five minutes, how are you gonna get across to your main points? And then on the flip side, if you have an extended period of time, how are you, what points are you going to talk about in full detail? And I think it's always helpful to review those things and to um, you know, go through your portfolio beforehand. If you're doing any presenting of your portfolio, please, please, please rehearse your, your work so that it doesn't feel like you're, you're almost viewing your own portfolio for the first time in front of someone. Um, that's always interesting is to see people be like, oh, what? I don't remember this project being in here. And it's like, well, it's your portfolio. You know, how would you not know it's not in there? Um, so having it, you know, going through it, actually flipping pages, you know, sit in front of a mirror and really just kind of um, see how you're speaking about the work. You'll also notice little nuances in your own um, ability to speak about it and talk about it. You might have a lot of fillers, a lot of ums, and a lot of, you know, stuffs and things like that that kind of fill up time and space that you want to kind of try to uh, fix a little bit or, or reduce as you talk about it. Um, but it also helps just kind of uh, walk you through that story and, and have you be able to rehearse that. And even if you wanted to uh, recite stuff to a roommate or to a friend, that helps too to kind of, um, you know, they'll give you some feedback. They'll give you some information to just be like, oh, you kind of, you waned in energy on this project, you know, you were really going strong and then all of a sudden this project came up and you were kind of, eh, kind of lukewarm on that one. Um, that's good information to have because that will come across. Um, what else? Um, always, you know, when you're, when you're laying things out, when you're creating, crafting your portfolio, always, always, always consider it from the other person's perspective. Um, your portfolio is not necessarily for you. It's, it's a representation of you but, and your work, but it's not meant to be presented back to you. It's presented to be presented to someone else. So making sure that you're always being aware that this is going to be presented to someone who potentially has no idea who you are, no idea what your background is or where you're coming from on things. You now need to convince them that uh, this is your work and you, you own it, you're passionate about it, you're excited about it, and this is what you know, went into these projects that you're uh, showing off and creating. And so uh, figuring out a way through text and, or, or through uh, images and very limited text, how you're able to do that and build that up. Um, the last thing I'll say, um, if it's a printed piece, if it's a printed portfolio, uh, make sure that you're printing it out, actually print it out first and have a rough draft. Um, you'll notice spelling mistakes, you'll notice any sort of errors that show up. Um, it, it's also good to just kind of have to, to go through, you can go through with a red pen and just kind of start to look at things differently because sometimes what you see on screen looks really good and then you print it out and you're like, oh man, like this printed giant, this printed tiny, like this just the, you know, the ratio of things don't, doesn't make sense. The connection the, between these images doesn't make sense. It's always important to actually print it out and see it physically in front of you. Um, just as you would kind of present it to a real client or a real person. And I think, I don't know, is that, is that helpful? Is this, is this kind of. That um, last point was especially helpful. I had never thought of just, I mean, that's such a simple, that's simple advice, you know? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe one thing I had to ask you that if you could elaborate on is how do you, how do you start? Say you get a job that's designing a can or something. How do you, or, or a poster or board layout, how do you start? Yeah, great question. Um, so the way I start projects um, typically is, um, you know, I kind of follow a little bit of the design thinking process. So the first thing I would do is really empathize with what is happening. So um, figuring out what does this client really need and creating, you know, even if I'm jotting down notes of, 
usually it's based on a, an initial interview with a client or I call them partners. Some, you know, it's client or partners, but like um, I usually work with that partner to try to figure out what they really need. What are their goals? What are their, you know, reasons for doing this project and what do they hope to have outcomes from it? That quickly moves into sketches. So I'm a firm believer. I'm always carrying around a sketchbook and pencils and um, writing down, jotting down notes and thumbnails and things because I've come to learn that, you know, I will have great ideas sitting at a traffic light and I hate it because I'll, you know, have that idea in my head and by the time I get home, it's gone. So if I have a tiny little notebook in my pocket, I can now jot things down and just get that out of my head. Um, but it really quickly moves into sketches, pencils on paper. If you're more comfortable digitally, that's fine too. Like get comfortable just writing down those things because once you can kind of sit down and really devote some time to that project, then you can pull all those things together. Um, then I start to develop, um, I'll just kind of, for example, like a logo project. I'll develop um, just multiple iterations of this logo and just really, you know, push this as far as I can go. Once I've kind of um, rendered maybe, I, I would say like a dozen different logo designs, then I would narrow those down to about three that I want to show the client. Um, and then I would make those in a more digital version and then present those. And then um, usually there's some discussion uh, about, you know, various aspects of it that I'll probably have to go back and fix. You know, des design is never a one-way street where I just say, here you go. Okay, nice knowing you. You know, now it's a conversation of what works, what doesn't. Um, you know, maybe they really hate blue and I happen to accidentally put blue in this, you know, hopefully that's stuff that's covered up front, but it's the, the conversation needs to continue and, and fix whatever it is that they're looking for. Um, and, and also to defend my own work. So maybe sometimes it's also pushing back and saying, no, I really do think it needs to be blue because X, Y, Z. And that's where they're relying on your expertise. Um, and, and throughout that conversation, usually it's narrowed down to one option that they really enjoy. Um, I kind of go back to the drawing board and really refine that design, uh, make it, you know, the, the polished final product that they need, uh, save it in a variety of formats, turn it over, and, and that's kind of the, the extent of the project. I would say one thing to consider for portfolios is to really show, um, show some of that work that, that exists in leading up to that final piece. So, uh, for example, I tell a lot of graphic designers, take two or three of your projects in your portfolio and I actually have them, um, so if you have like a two page spread to your portfolio, I actually encourage them to have a third page uh, for occasions when a client might be really interested in the final piece, have a third page that opens up, it's completely invisible. So if you're in an interview and you're running out of time, you know they're not gonna notice that this third page exists, but if they're really into what you're saying, open up this third page and explain your process, show them all your sketches, show them all your process work, show them all the, color combinations and little notes that you made along the way, because people would like to see sort of what went into that project. You know, they want to see, are you a good fit for our agency or for our, our group or, you know, whatever it is that you're kind of applying for, they want to see how you do your work. And so um, that's kind of a nice way of just kind of a, a quick insight into your brain a little bit or how you work things, right? Um, it, it's not a, a completely accurate picture, but it's much closer than just sort of showing them the final product and saying, this is all I have. Um, it's nice to see like, oh, you do sketches. Cool. That's great. You know, we do sketches or, oh, you write down lists of adjectives and narrow down uh, personalities of brands or logos. And, you know, the, oh, we came up with 20 different options for that logo to come down to this final one. That's great. That's awesome. That's what we do here kind of thing. Um, so it's just kind of important to show your work a little bit if you can. That's really great, Jeff. Thanks for, um, giving all that insight. I think that's like, I mean, maybe it's just me. I don't know. But when within our like realm of landscape architecture, oftentimes we, we don't get to have the conversation that you were talking about that you have back and forth between you and the client. We just put it out there and then it gets critiqued and then we never look at it again. <laughs> and so I think that's like really important to recognize that, especially when we're portfolio building. Um, I don't know. It's, yeah. Something that, I mean, as a student, it's, it might be different, obviously, than the professional world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be. Um, I, I think it's important to, you know, be prepared for any of those situations. And, and that's where it, it, it's hard to sort of say exactly, you know, one, I wish there was one way I could, sh I could share with you of how to make these and how to present them. And 
um, that it was universal across the board, but it's just, it just isn't that way. And I guess part of the, the good thing is that because it's becoming so um, diversified in how people are presenting their work, it's, it's sort of, there is no wrong way to do it anymore. Um, you know, there isn't a really, uh, there, there may be in your specific field, I don't know per se, um, you know, if there's just an absolute do not do this kind of thing. But, um, you know, if I was to uh, review some graphic design portfolios, I would probably expect half of them to be virtual, half of them to show up with iPads and walk me through something on a, a tablet. I would expect half of them to be printed. Um, I would expect half of them to be on websites, probably, uh, things like that. So it's really just kind of a variety. And I would say, uh, you know, be prepared as best you can for any sort of scenario that you're at least aware of and, and ask people, ask other, um, you know, people out in the world what, what, um, what they expect and what would they like to see. And um, I know, at least in graphic design, I know a lot of designers are, are more than welcome to like share their, their secrets, quote unquote, because it's, you know, we, we keep those quiet and for no particular reason other than nobody really just asks us. <laughs> Um, maybe we could talk about text for a little bit. Um, yeah. Abby was sharing, sharing with me that there's actually a website out there that will tell you, um, say I'm using like a serif font, it'll mm -hmm. go out and tell me, you know, what font works with uh, serif if that's like my secondary font, what, what would be a good primary yeah. and tertiary. But what, yeah. do you, what, how do you approach text and, and all that? Yeah, so typography is interesting. Um, I teach a class on it. I taught one last semester um, where we're talking a lot about, we go into major depth into typography where um, if you, you're not super aware of, you know, typographic terms and letter forms and things like that, it, it gets really uh, detailed in terms of how close attention we pay to those things. Um, I'll have to check this out. I just saw that pop up in the chat there, but um, yeah, I want to check that out and see. But Typically, you're going to want to pair some of those things. So thinking about sans serif versus serif, um, sans serif is typically, you know, our, our display type, something we lead with a title. We like to, we like to read extended text. So something like a, you think of a newspaper is going to be in sans or is in serif, where it allows multiple words to be connected with the serifs. So it kind of, you think of them almost as little ligatures between letters. They kind of helps our eye just sort of go through the tone of the, the text. Whereas if it was a sans serif, it has very immediate stops and that kind of um, is jarring to our subconscious when we read. So it's kind of important to just distinguish between the two and when you want to use them. Um, there's definitely some, some times to use certain ones and times to not. Uh, it's really about focusing on the, the actual you know design qualities of that type so if you have a, a serif that you're using um, it has a, a really you know geometric shape to it and, and it's mostly you can kind of decide this by comparing it to other typefaces like bring up a couple other typefaces on your computer if you're not super familiar with typefaces and just kind of compare them you know is there one that seems more geometric than another or one that seems more um, bolder than another or thicker or uh, has different qualities to it and then try to find and pair that quality to a, a sans serif. And usually that will kind of help to balance a little bit of that. You'll want to kind of, um, you know, experiment a little bit and see. And that's also where I would recommend printing out your final piece because it'll, it'll really show up there. Um, you know, again, on, on digital, sometimes it looks better a little bit because you have this backlit display and everything looks really nice and crisp. Sometimes when you print it out, it's not quite what you thought it would be. Um, so it's also helpful there too. But um, yeah, in terms of pairing, I usually just try to pair qualities of type. Usually there's some historical significance in the type. So uh, I do some research in terms of what that typeface actually did, does or what it was intended to do, um, when like it was created or what sort of time period it was supposed to entail. So like if I want something that is really reminiscent of an early 1900s, I'm going to go and try to find a typeface that was sort of you know, referenced during that time or, or was copied from letterpress and into a, uh, a modern font now, um, you know, by a, a current uh, type house or something like that. And so there's, there's definitely some research you can do to sort of track down what uh, the, the type was intended for, for the most part. Most good fonts will have a, a font designer on the other end or a typographer who has described sort of what the intent of that font was. Uh, and sometimes they'll even, you know, uh, do you the, the, 
the service of, of pairing it themselves and, and saying that here's some suggestions that I recommend you pair this with and um, some really good fonts that, that work well with it. The thing that you really just don't want is um, jarring juxtaposition of tonality. And, and what that means is you just kind of have to um, lay, the tech, lay the type down, walk away from it, come back to it and just look it over and see, does your eye just kind of naturally want to read this? And does it want to um, just kind of, you know, go over the page like you would expect someone to go over a page? Or is it really stuck on, man, that J is just not working for me. It just sticks out. It's just not, you know, it's spaced weird and it doesn't look right. Um, Cause someone else is probably gonna see that too. And it's really being that picky about sometimes the type where you really have to nitpick the little details and be like, ooh, that's just, this isn't working. I just need to, you know, change. Maybe it's the size, maybe it's the, you know, the uh, layout or the, the location of the type or something like that. But um, yeah, it's sometimes just kind of, uh, you know, try, trial and error too, and just figuring out, try a different couple typefaces and just see what works. Um, and sometimes type is limited by even the type itself. So pick a family that has a pretty extended collection of fonts to choose from. So usually you'll have a, a, a regular, a bold, um, and an italic. I would even find a family that has a semi-bold, uh, a heavy or a thick version, um, and, and even some uh, really thin or extra thin uh, typefaces in that family, because it's always nice to have um, a variety to choose from. And, and so if you have one family that has all these different sort of thicknesses to it, um, that's usually usually really helpful. Obviously, that's a pretty deep topic because I didn't know there was a class on it. That's awesome. Maybe I got a little too far into that. Sorry, I really geek out on type sometimes, so I can you know go on forever about that. But well, I think we needed that though. We've never that kind of language is foreign to us. So I think that's really really great that you mentioned that. Yeah, and you know, really kind of um, if you if you really want to get into it, really uh, what I encourage you to do is like pick up like a local magazine, like some something that's free, you know, at the, the supermarket or something and just page through it with only the mentality of looking at type and see which articles look good to you or which ones like really feel like, ooh, I like this. This just feels good. Like, I don't care about the pictures. I don't care about the layout. Just look at like kind of the type and just look at like how the spacing between lines looks and how the, the, is it a serif that you're attracted to? Is it a sans serif, you know, and like, is it really thin? Is it really thick? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and just kind of look through that thing and just kind of mark down a couple ideas. So that if you want, you can go back there and be like, okay, um, you know, what I have on my computer, the lines, and we call it letting the space between different lines of text where, you know, if that letting needs to be uh, increased, then you know that it needs to be increased because, you know, what you have on your computer is much different than what you, you're seeing and what you're enjoying. And there's, there's a reason for that. You just need to adjust it a little bit. Um, maybe if, does anybody else have anything that specifically with graphic design we want Jeff to elaborate on before kind of shift the conversation? Yeah, we have some questions here in the room. Yeah. Um, Haley said she has a question. Yeah. Yeah. So, the question that I have is, if besides you just said that a good place to look is magazines to look at um, types, but where else is a good place to look for examples of either portfolios or of layouts or what's like a go-to place to find layouts like besides Pinterest? Yeah, um, if you want to see, um, it, it, you know, and it's not necessarily laid out particularly as a portfolio, like a printed portfolio all the time, but I would recommend uh, going through Behance, um, Behance.com, they do a good job of showcasing at least designers' portfolios. Um, I, I'm trying to think. That's that's a really good place for portfolio work. Um, a lot of people will just kind of upload their whole portfolio to that. Um, even just doing a Google search for you know a very specific area of, in your guys's case, art, you know, architecture and portfolios, seeing if anything comes up. Um, I know if you type in like graphic design portfolios, you're going to get just crap, to be honest. You're going to get just really <laughs> terrible portfolios. Um, and I don't know why that is. It's just the really bad stuff shows up. Um, so you really kind of have to know the industry. So I would say, you know, if there's a place, uh, if there's a, a club, an organization, something like that, that, you know, architects are part of that you can sort of 
I know um, AIGA is the graphic design equivalent where there's portfolios that you can look at and jobs that you can apply for and things like that. So I don't know if there's an equally um, uh, an equal representation in some form of a club for architecture or not, but that would be something to take a look at. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Um, there was a graphic designer uh, who came into an architecture hosted um, graphic design workshop last year. His name is uh, Ludwig Herrera. And he yeah. suggested, he suggested uh, Behance too. He said that's yeah. where he finds a lot of his inspiration. And then he obviously um, recommended that we go check out his stuff. Is there, so just because you've been speaking on kind of the behalf of how you approach it, do you have a Behance that we could go like just uh, reference? <laughs> Sadly, I don't know if I do. <laughs> I was just curious. Um, I'm not, not yeah, to put you on the um, spot. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, the thing is, is I really, I should. And it's actually, it, it, it is literally on my to-do list to put one together because I wanted to have multiple portfolios out there. Um, I spent all my time at the beginning of Serial to put together just a website. Mm -hmm. So if you want, um, I can share that the website quick and just kind of show you a little bit of what went into that. Um, but otherwise I don't really have a, a portfolio site per se, cause I kind of, I actually went a little bit different with what I was doing. Um, I started out right after school, having a print portfolio, um, that I would carry around in a bag and, and do that whole thing after a while. And as technology advanced, things changed a little bit. And I, uh, went from no longer needing a physical portfolio to just kind of showing work and, um, now the work that I've done is just kind of out there and it's got enough attention that people just kind of come to me for work. And I, I really haven't needed to sort of present a portfolio. I would if it was a very large client that had no clue who I was. If I was bidding for a job, say, or something like that, I would need to go in and present something. But um, yeah, right now I just kind of have the website up and people can go there and take a look. And mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, that kind of spells out enough information for the most part for, mm -hmm. for most people, at least. Yeah, I'll make sure I include the link to your website in uh, the, uh, the recap we always send out. Sure. Does anybody else have questions in the, uh, in the room over there? Or Shane, Trey? Nobody, not right now. <laughs> right. Maybe we'll um, think of them. Maybe to be uh, respectful of your time, Jeff, um, maybe we just spend about 15 to 20 minutes maybe uh, going over like a real quick um, critique of a few portfolios. Because I know like for mine, I have a very simple question. And then um, I know there's other people that are struggling with a, you know, a roadblock when it comes to either layout or, uh, or any kind of uh, thing that is, it relates to graphic design in a, in a sure. portfolio. So. Yeah. Yeah, I could definitely do that. Yeah. Does does anybody want to go first? I can allow them to share their screen. Otherwise, I'd be happy to. Yeah, Ben, why don't you go first? Okay. Um, here, I'll share my screen then. I've been laying out um, my projects in InDesign. And I was asking Abby about this. And she was telling me it needs something, it needs something else. And I have three of what I consider like my most passionate projects. Mm -hmm. And I really like this, this oil color or this oil type Photoshop style. So I take a rendering and I, I give it a Photoshop um, oil painting style. And then I kind of just feather out the picture and that becomes the left side of the spread. So it's just this big, you know, blaring image. But as it relates to the other side, I feel that there's a big disconnect. Do you think that um, this needs to all become kind of this cohesive blob of oil painting or like what? Well, I know there's not like a, a perfect answer, but how, how do you suggest like I approach this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to suggest, can you um, see it in uh, a, a preview mode without the... the um guides Absolutely. on there yeah thank you there you go yeah um one thing uh it, would this be like a would this be a printed portfolio at some point yes so for yeah. the purpose of the workshop um we're all doing printed portfolios most of them are eight and a half by 11 spreads okay mm -hmm. um and how are they sort of put together is there a mechanism for are they just stapled are they like is there a hole punch is there... i'm gonna print them through uh vista print 
at the end okay. for everybody who completes it. Um, so it'll be a hardcover binder. Okay. Is there, um, do, does it go into like sleeves or something or? Um, I'm not sure. I, I think what the, I haven't looked into like specifically how we're going to print it, but it'll be, I imagine like a photo album. So you, okay. you open it up. Um, that's usually okay. how people do it in the, in our industry, our line of, line yep. of work. So this is where, um, you know, I would suggest uh, even printing out like one spread just mm -hmm. so you can see it printed on paper. Um, one thing that I think you might uh, notice right away is a, a couple things. And that's one is to figure out where your margins are going to be as far as and that's why I mentioned, is it going to be three hole punched or something like that? Because if there is, you have to take into account that middle part or a top part, because mm -hmm. um, on the right side, you do have it is pretty um, tight against the boundaries there. Mm -hmm. One thing to consider is to maybe bring some of that information in just a little bit uh, because the image on the left, it has a little more room to breathe around it. It'll tie more in if you kind of keep this, the shape of what's on the right similar to kind of what's on the left. Now, that doesn't mean you have to like imitate that shape or anything, but um, if there's a lot of white space on the left, you want to see a little bit more of that white space, I think, on the right and kind of balance right. that out because right now the right feels a little heavy. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think where printing it out is going to help is you're going to see which images um, need to be large and which ones don't. Because sometimes, um, you know, even looking on the left, I don't know how uh, totally uh, important or relevant the seeing all the software is, the little icons kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But that could be something that gets really, really small. And okay. it doesn't have to be quite so, um, you know, large really. Because if that's a half an inch icon, that's going to take up quite a bit of real estate. Mm -hmm. um, just something to think about. Um, I don't know. And that's where um, it's nice to see it and, and see it in, in real life, I think. Um, okay. Yeah. I'm glad you made that point about printing them off because I hadn't, that, something so simple that just hadn't occurred to, I, I don't think any of us. It's it's so overlooked and it's something that I did all the time as a student and I, and I you know, even did professionally where it's, it, it just caught up to me where I'm like, oh, I just need to print these off and, and see what it looks like first before mm -hmm. I hand it over to a client because sometimes I would spend so much time. And I think that's the thing is we spend so much time in our heads and in the software and we're moving things around. And finally we get to a point where we're like, oh, I think this looks okay. But then you don't know until it's actually printed. And then you're like, oh my God, why did I make any of those decisions? Because now that it's printed, I can see how things don't line up or things aren't quite, you know, the right size. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and the nice thing too, with the printout is just take a pen and make some notes on there and jot it down. Like this one needs to be smaller and this mm -hmm. one needs to be twice as big and I can reduce the type here and things yeah. like that. Maybe a follow-up question on that. Um, so you mentioned showing your process and a lot, a lot of like landscape architectures, people care about your process. They care about, you know, all the, all the software you used, your sketches, how you got there. Um, which is why I try to include some of that and why it probably gets crowded, is that you mentioned using a third page that flips out. Is that something that's yeah. pretty common now? Or would you say, I don't know how many portfolios you look at, but. No, <laughs> I would say it's not. I, I would say it's kind of, it's a, it's a way for me to kind of sneakily add more info than, than is recommended. Um, I would say most people wouldn't necessarily want you to do that. And that's why I only say like, do it for a couple couple projects and not all of them. Um, but it allows you that if you have, like there was a project that I worked on um, just as an example where uh, it was in grad school. And I think we had to, we had to actually sketch out a hundred logos before we moved into a digital version of it. And so I actually, you know, wanted to show a potential employer. Um, I look, I can sketch a hundred logos. Like, you know, was it fun? No, but you know, I did that work. And that was, <laughs> I think that was impressive to a lot of people I showed that I could actually do that. And so if there's work that you're really proud of that process, um, show it off. Like, I think that's important. Um, if you have some really killer sketches or you really put in a lot of extra, um, you know, options or, or you really, you know, thought about different ideas, I, I like that idea of, of seeing a little extra work and, and you can tell during an interview or something where, um, or, you know, if you guys were saying too, that you might not even have an interview, which is also nice because I think people can make the choice or not, they can flip open that third page and be sort of wowed by this extra work that you're showing them, or they can just choose to keep going. And that's fine too. Um, that's the kind of beauty of it is it's sort of there, but not there. It just depends on what that person is needing. 
I guess that gives me direction where to head with my with my question. Yeah. Uh, one question too on, on your how big is your text? Ooh. Um, let's see. I gotta go into my properties. It is 15 okay. on 11 by or eight and a half by eleven. Depending on how people are going to view it, I would say you could go down significantly on the text size. Really? Um, okay. That's an area too where um, it, it it looks great on on the, your screen, and then you print it out, and you're like, "Wow, that text is huge." Um, if if you know that you're going to show it to someone who has trouble with eyesight, that's that's one thing. Um, in our case, like I even tell students, if you're going to write a paper, it should at least be in eleven points or smaller because. And, and we're always told 12, right? You're always supposed to type it in 12 times New Roman for your papers and things like that. But uh, man, I, I cannot read it in 12 point font. It is really large and it's, um, it, it, we just don't read that way. If you were to pick up a book, it wouldn't be in 12 point font. It would be in at least 11 or 10 or something like that. Gives you more um, of the white space too, I, I, I'm sure. Yeah, yep, exactly. And it, it really just kind of, it makes the text look a little less bulky, a little less there. Um, again, it's one of those things where if people really want to read it, they can kind of, you know, they shouldn't have to squint their eyes, but they'll squint their eyes and they'll read it if they really want to read it. Um, mm -hmm. But they, they sh it shouldn't be one of those things that's sort of, you know, being broadcast to them and forcing them to read it. Thanks so for that. <laughs> Anybody else uh, in, in person or virtually have any sketches or screens to share? Um, we have a question in the room, and, and I don't know what like is the best example for this, but Emily was like wondering about <laughs> decorative elements or additional graphics that maybe are not like necessary to tell the story, but are there to enhance the vision and the theme. And specifically, she was talking about um, on yours, Ben, when you had the perspective on the left side how you did like the oil paint um coming out of the square um i guess like how i don't know what i don't even know what to ask <laughs> did you, did you want to have a whole theme like with the decorative elements eventually take away more than they're adding i don't know if you can hear me did you yeah. hear her yeah um okay. I'm, I'm trying to think uh I mean, my overall, my personal overall reaction is to keep uh, decorative elements to a minimum as long as they are um, not disrupting things. Like I think uh, Ben's years, I feel like made sense because it, it carried through, like it, it helped enhance that story a little bit better. And it didn't feel, um, it didn't feel jarring or out of place because it felt like this was your uh, rendering. And it just kind of had that more of that style to it. I think it'd be more jarring if you did it like in uh, one style on that, like one page, and then you move to a different style on another page, and then a different style on another page. Like I would say if it's if it's maintains that same style throughout, that's important. Um, unless there's a really good reason why you would change it up. But I would definitely avoid too many decorative elements. Um, I always kind of tell students to like design over decoration um, and, and just kind of keeping in mind like decoration feels good when you're doing it because you get to play and you get to do some fun things. Um, but really keep in mind that end user, do they want to see it? Do they want to, uh, if it doesn't enhance anything, um, I, I would get rid of it. You know, it, it's just, there's no reason to really have it unless it's, it brings an extra level of, of something that you're able to talk about. So hopefully that helps. I'm, I'm trying to also think of a good example of what um, what I've seen or experienced. I know with design, we have a lot. I, I have the problem with students who want to over decorate their portfolios with design work. So they'll have a lot of these like flourishes and you know wavy lines and things like that. And it's just, for me personally, it's like, get rid of all of it. it, it even if that's sort of your, your brand, uh, it just doesn't do anything. It distracts me from the work. And it really takes me away from from seeing the work you're doing and it's making me focus on um, other things, other elements that are being thrown at me a little bit. So that's just kind of my own two cents, I guess. That's really good. That's distracting the work. Yeah, that was good. I think we all 
heard that loud and clear. <laughs> um, okay, I guess I have my portfolio. I'll share just like a couple pages, but I feel like you talked about a lot of the stuff already. Um, and I don't know. How do I turn the things on? Uh, click W. That's a shortcut for it. Ah, cool. Okay, this is my first page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to keep it really simple, but I did pick three different fonts, and these are the ones that I chose because, I, and I found them off the website that I put in the um, the chat, um, and I found the one for my name that I really, really liked. Um, I thought it was kind of trendy. And so I looked up that font and I was like, which fonts pair well with Orpheus Pro? And so that's how I found the other two. Mm -hmm. um, the one on the bottom, I would have had to like purchase the real font that they had um, suggested, but I found one that was for free off Google Fonts, I think that was pretty similar. Nice. Yep. <laughs> so that's how I got there. And I just wanted to keep it like, I've had this idea of wanting to make it look like I cut out a piece of the paper without actually cutting out a piece of the paper. So I don't know if I actually did that, but mm -hmm. there's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's the table of contents. It's still a work in progress, but I don't, I don't necessarily know if I want to organize it this way, but it kind of helps my work in progress brain categorize mm -hmm. what I need. Um, and then I have four works on here. I've kind of been battling if I should have just one giant like work like this, this image here on the top left. Maybe I should just have the whole page be that graphic instead of all four of them. Um, but I don't know, they're, they're like a theme and they go together and I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think, um one quick comment to make and th this is something that i i learned kind of going through portfolios too is and, and it was mostly when i really had to be in front of someone and had to kind of walk them through a two-page spread is to deal with both pages and so um i used to have one page that was designed kind of similar to this where it would just have kind of uh, pictures of projects and then i'd go to the next page and it was still more pictures of that same project um and i really ditched that for this idea, um, kind of what Ben had, where it, it's really focusing on the two pages being um, one page really enhancing one really dramatic, like bring you in kind of image, and then the rest to just supplement that image. Because I really found that when I broke my projects down, there was one image that I could either create or make that would just really bring in my viewer, and then the rest would just help enhance it versus trying to make every image have the same equal amount of importance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so something to think about is maybe, you know, is there one image or even a couple images, you know, maybe it's two that you can put up there side by side that um, that are even a little larger that really bring people in and then they, then they can see some of the other details that go into it. But um, I think I made the mistake early on in, in my career of making portfolios have, I wanted all of them to have equal weight. And I realized that's not really interesting. It really helps to create that story by, I, I would even set up my own, um, like let's say it was a product or a, a logo on something. I would make sure to have a sample of that thing printed. I would go shoot my own photo so that it looked really good. Um, and that would be my image that I would start with instead of, you know, here's my business card and here's my logo and here's my stationery. And, um, place all these different things about, and that got a little confusing. So anyway, mm -hmm. something to think about. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think that kind of helped settle the battle in my mind that I was thinking of when I was laying this page out. And I only have a couple of them, but it's kind of like a similar theme where mm -hmm. I have like the two or the four, or if it's just the one, um, and then the three. I don't know. Yeah. So in my brain, I was, I was kind of, I was thinking like, okay, people are going to see this on a computer and they're not going to see it printed out. And so I just wanted to do the one page spread where it didn't matter if I had another page connected to it, because I mean, maybe they're just going to pause and 
have a conversation about this one page like we are right now. Um, so that was kind of like the perspective I was coming from when creating this, but maybe I shouldn't be doing that, like you said. Maybe I should well, break it up. Yeah, and that, and that depends. I would say, you know, in that case, if you if you know that the viewer is going to see it in a, a digital space or online or something, that's different than seeing it in a two-page spread all the time. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, if that's the case, maybe this is okay then, and um, you could continue to do this. Uh, it just depends. If you want, if you want it printed, then you might um, consider something else. But sure. Yeah. Okay. I do appreciate okay. Abby that. Each page, you let you let the work speak for itself. There's very minimal text. I think that's mm -hmm. attractive for a, a virtual um, experience of reading it, anyways. Yeah, thank you. I just, I mean, it was, it's like part of it is like, yeah, it's a lot less work, but I already did the work. <laughs> yeah, you know, we've been working together that. for how many weeks on this portfolio workshop, and that's the first time I've seen your portfolio. <laughs> Anyone else, Trey, would you like to share? I'm be honest, I'm going a whole different direction now. Like this is very loose based on what you guys are doing. And just <laughs> this was like just to get something on paper and I really didn't like it before. So, I mean, if you want to see it, I'm more than happy to share it, but there's not a lot here. Yeah. Would you like to share yours? Oh, I'm going to do find one. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Shane, I guess, yeah, you probably would. I, I do at least have a, uh, a question. So uh, the firm that I want to apply to, uh, you know, I, I've done a little bit of research, you know, I've at least looked on their website and looked at some of their projects and this and that. And one of my ideas was I could take their color theme from like their website and put it into my portfolio. Uh, one, I'm curious, is that just a good idea in general, or does that feel like a, like, would they feel like I'm stealing from them? And the other one would be, you know, uh, obviously a lot of our projects tend to be very, uh, green, you know, uh, the, the colors mm -hmm. I couldn't, I could try to find the exact colors, but, uh, it's more of like, a more towards like a light tan color and like a blue color. And I, most of mine are just green so how would I mix use that theme but for the projects that are a completely different set um let's see I think for definitely for the first question I would say um honestly my experience would be that it wouldn't matter at all <laughs> I think um as far as like taking the colors I think um if there's a place that you want to work at the thing that I've picked up is that they're less concerned that you match visually and more concerned that you match uh more conceptually so uh I I would say that even more so they would want to see your own voice so if there's other colors that speak more to you and your personality and what you're about I would showcase those more so than their brand colors because half the people at that place may not even care about their brand colors. They might've been in place before they even got there or something. Um, right. And, and it, definitely not stealing. I don't think anyone would ever accuse you of that. It's more of just, uh, I think there'd be a moment of, oh, wow, this guy made our made this, his stuff look like our stuff. You know, it, it wouldn't, I, I don't think it would impress or, or dissuade them in any way. I think it's, um, yeah, I think, I think they would probably more want to see your personality. And to that extent too, I would say, go through the content of their work, like, like go through like when they write about their own work and keep like a notebook or keep notes of words that they use, like specific adjectives, specific like um, descriptive words and use those in you, how you talk about your work. So if you ever go in for an interview, if you ever write little pieces of your work, interject them use that same language that they're using because that will be more impactful than using like their colors okay um for this can you explain the second part again i guess i got kind of lost on well that well um it, it would just be uh uh how to you know use a completely different color theme compared to my projects which are you know gotcha. a different color theme how, yeah would those would clash say, would that make that just idea not work or is there a way to do that I think, I mean, I think you could kind of take it a couple different ways. You could 
Um, you could pay attention to the fact that it is green and then sort of adapt your palette to it. So using complementary colors or adjacent colors of green, you know, use some blues or some uh, yellows or things like that. Maybe not yellow, I guess, but, um, and you also want to kind of stay away from NDSU colors because that would be kind of cheesy in the long run too. So um, yeah, kind of thinking about a, a palette of colors that might exist along with them or just go completely neutral in what you're doing and keep, um, you know, keep text to a, a black or a gray and just leave it at that. Any sort of elements that is black or gray, um, that just kind of help, helps neutralize everything so that it has more uniformity to it. Um, but you could add little little spots of color if there's a if there's a specific tone of green that you maybe want to grab, even like mm -hmm. uh, color picking in Photoshop, grab a, a green that kind of works and use it strategically throughout. That could be a way to do it too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that answers my question. Cool, thanks. <laughs> We have one more question from this group here, yeah. and then we could probably wrap it up just in consideration of your time. Um, but that's from Haley. Yeah, actually, I have two questions really quickly. Um, one's on length of portfolio because I feel like we get different answers from people, um, <laughs> and then the other one is like putting in work from previous like jobs. Like, do you just want to include schoolwork and your interests, or is it weird to include, you know, things that you've worked on on like jobs? You know, of course, you have to include that you, that it's, mm -hmm. you know, from that company and like things like that. Sure. Great questions. Um, uh, God, now I, got, I went down that rabbit hole. What was the first question again? <laughs> Um, length of portfolio, like Perfect. how many yeah. pages is too many or how many projects should you include? Yeah. yeah. And you, you will hear a different number from everybody you talk to. Um, and it ranges, I would say the absolute maximum you would ever hear in a portfolio is probably like 20 and that's on a very large scale. Like I would say that's way too much personally. Um, I recommend students keep it somewhere around the 10 range if possible. So it like 10 projects. Fun. Oh, okay. yeah, 10 projects, um, maybe uh, that equals out to 20 pages or so, uh, something like that. But um, again, you know, I would much rather see eight kick ass projects than 15 sort of mediocre projects. Um, so yeah, keep, you know, don't worry about um, length necessarily. Keep your focus entirely on the quality of the work, if you can. Um, and then to that extent, uh, um, and now remind me the second question again. <laughs> um, like work that you've done for an office. Yeah. So yeah. I would say don't put anything in your portfolio that you don't want to do or showcase. Um, meaning, uh, okay, so here's a good example. Um, I put in uh parts in my portfolio that were websites because i was told early on that you know graphic designers need to do websites and granted i can i can create a website i'm going to tell you right now i hate designing websites that is just not my jam someone else can do that i like print that is where i find the most joy um so i completely started taking out websites from my portfolio because the thing is is as soon as someone sees that work they're going to say oh you can do websites <laughs> And then all of a sudden, if you don't like doing websites, you're screwed, <laughs> right? You're in that job where it's like, now they're going to start giving you websites, the thing you don't want to do. And that's not to say that you're losing an opportunity, because to be honest, I don't want a job where I'm designing websites every day. That's, that, that, that sounds terrible to me. I don't want that. So I'm actually glad that I maybe avoided that job by not including websites in my portfolio, right? Um, now that can't, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't like, I think I have like one in my portfolio now just to show people. And even then it gets brought up and I say, I designed the websites, I designed the upfront stuff, but I have someone else do the back end coding and that's how I operate. Um, so it, it involves more of a conversation. And so I think it's, it's definitely worth it to put it through the test of, do you actually want to do that work? Do you want to continue that work? So if it's past jobs that really have no relevance to what you want to do, don't put it in there. Um, if it's if it's interest that you have that you're not confident in or you're not, you don't feel like it really represents you, 
don't put it in. Um, uh, you know, thinking about like you know, photography or something like that, if that's in there, if you don't want to do photography, I don't know if I would put it in there um, because you might get stuck with it. At the same time, if you enjoy it and you want to do that, great, that's awesome. Then you're showing them that you have this extra skill. So only put stuff in there that you really want to continue to pursue. Um, otherwise you're showing them stuff that you've done, but man, if you don't want to do it, you're just, you're shooting yourself in the leg because <laughs> ultimately they might take you up on that. And um, that's not fun for anybody. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have any last minute questions that they're just needing to ask at the moment? And these are all great questions. Like, thank you guys for asking these. These are awesome. Yeah, well, it looks like we've kind of come to an end of our um, portfolio workshop. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and of, of your night to come and join us and have this conversation. We really, really appreciate it especially having um, advice and opinions from you. Um, you know, it's, it's really special. Maybe we can um, invite you to come back again to not only have a conversation with us, but all of the other students in our program because I really think we do need it. Um, yeah, but absolutely. again, thank you so much. Um, have a good night and let us know if you have any questions. Will do. Yeah. Thank right. you guys so much for having me. If you need anything, if you ever want to like just reach out and say hi or, you know, send me your portfolio and if there's something you want me to take a look at, I'd be happy to do it. Um, I don't know. My, it's easy to track down my email address on there and I'm always in Renaissance Hall on third floor. So uh, yeah. Right. I'll make sure to include that resource. information then in the recap. So thank, thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. Good luck. All right. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.